This video is going to talk about Java multi-threading. This is a pretty advanced topic. Um, we'll go through kind of what it means, and then we'll look at an example of how to start using multi-threading and really showing how it fails um, often. So what is multi-threading? Um, why do we want to do this? It, in essence, it's saying that we have more than one set of execution, a set of um, instructions that we want to execute at the same time. And we can call this set of, of uh, instructions executing a thread. And we're going to say that they can ex execute simultaneously, um, but share different resources. So what does it mean to be executing simultaneously? Well, the, the probably prevalent example to think about is in your computer, you probably have a dual core machine or quad core machine or something like that that you've, you've heard from Intel or AMD. This means that you can have more than one instruction executing at a time. Um, you in essence have little CPUs within the bigger CPU that can all execute an instruction. Um, so this means you can have several parallel tracks of code running at the same time. So you can run your code in parallel. When you can run your code in parallel, this means that they are data independent. They don't um, rely on data in the other pieces of code that are executing. And when they run in parallel like this, this is known as something called concurrency. So I talked about resources. They, they're independent blocks of code, but they share resources. And what are these resources possibly? Um, very often or always, they're sharing some kind of memory, a, maybe a data structure, um, maybe just a single variable. They can share file handles, so if you've opened up a file on your disk and you're writing to it, you can have several threads writing to it at the same time uh, or reading. Sometimes they'll share a network socket. These are all examples of resources. Now earlier I mentioned data dependency. Let's talk about that a little bit more so we can solidify this concept. Um, when a line of code doesn't depend on another line of code, then those are considered independent. A really great example of this would be when you're trying to, in graphics, trying to generate pixel data that you're going to render to the screen. One pixel on the screen doesn't depend on the data in another pixel um, to know how it's supposed to render. And, and actually, this is why um, we have GPUs which have hundreds and hundreds of cores because, in essence, almost any pixel could be um, being processed in parallel because there's no data dependency between them. Just a pretty banal example. In, on the left-hand side, you know, we have x equals 7, and then y is dependent on what x is equal to, and then in the third line, Z is again dependent on what Y is um, already calculated as. On the other hand, we have independent lines of code where we're just setting up three different variables that don't depend on each other. So we have this concept, but why do you want to use it? And the idea is to speed up your execution. If you have a program that can parallelize nicely, meaning that you don't have a lot of data dependency, then you can, um, in theory, reduce your execution time by how, um, how many ever cores you can execute at one point. So if you've got two cores in your machine and you can nicely split your code into two separate parts, then you might be able to reduce your execution time by half. This is the ideal case that usually doesn't happen. Um, lots of times, the other reason multi-threading is nice is because you might have a piece of code that is waiting on a file to open from the disk. And, and 
going out to the disk is much, much slower than your CPU is executing. So your thread will have to wait until that data comes back from disk. And while that's happening, you might as well have other threads doing other work. Um, or waiting on a network socket is another example of the same thing. Or outputting um, I.O. to the console. You know, when you anytime you write to the console, that's a very slow process compared to the CPU just executing in the background. So this sounds really nice and good and all, but it is an extremely hard thing to program. Um, first of all, to remove all those data dependencies or to get enough chunks of code that are data dependent, um, you may just have algorithms can, that cannot be split up very nicely. Um, and then the next thing that happens is uh, we're very used to writing out our code and we know in what order it's going to execute just from how we've written it. This is no longer the case when we start getting into the multi-threaded environment. It's not guaranteed to execute in the sequence it's written in and most of the time it won't. Um, and this also makes debugging the code very challenging because errors are not always reproducible you'll get different behavior from run to run. Um, you may get, you may see things called deadlock where everybody's waiting on the same resource and can no longer access it. Um, and then the next time you run it, that may not happen again. Or you run code and you might get the expected output. And then the next time you run it, um, all the numbers are different. And we're gonna look at an example of that. So multi-threading in Java is very much built into our object structure, our class structure. You can either extend the thread class and have a subclass, um, which will override the run function. And then within the run function, that's your block of code that you're going to um, execute in that thread. And then the other way to do it is um, to extend the runnable interface. And this is almost identical to extending our class, the subclass, um, but it's an interface where you just have to provide an implementation for run again. So the Java threads have this particular life cycle. And the first one, um, sorry, the first state that a Java thread is in when it starts up when you call um, you know new thread or new whatever your thread class is called enters into the new state once you call start this will now enter into the runnable state and at this point your thread is ready for the JVM scheduling to pick it up and start running it and start executing it and when that happens when it does actually call your run function a run method it will move it into the running state now, when you're in the running state, um, several things can happen and you can be preempted by a different um, thread that has a higher priority than you do. Uh, you can complete. Um, you can, the thread itself may need to sleep for some reason. And these reasons, or sorry, waiting or sleeping will actually put you into the waiting state. But you can always transition back to the running state and eventually um, this you should, if things are executing properly, transition finally to the dead state, which is where you've completed all the execution for that thread. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. And in this example, we're going to create um, a thread through the subclass arrangement where we're extending thread, and then we override the run method. And in this run method, we're just going to have, we have one print line, and then we're going to um, take a count, a static count variable that's actually defined in this thread example class, and we're just going to keep adding one to it over and over and over again. And every time we add to it, we're going to call sleep on the thread. So the thread will go to sleep. It'll go into that waiting state. Then we're also going to use our implements um, runnable, our interface, to create another thread. And here we call, in our run again, we're just going to keep um, implement, or sorry, 
incrementing our count variable. So both of these threads are using the count variable. That's their shared resource. They're going, both going to modify it. If we look at what should happen in this code, um, you would expect you know, thread one and thread two to print and then count by the end of, of both um, threads completing you would expect the count variable to be at 200 since they're both executing this 200 times. And in our main, we just go ahead and create the two threads, um, call start in the different fashions depending on whether it's the subclass or the interface implementation. And then um, thread one, I'm going to send it to sleep for a little bit. So if we go ahead and compile, and then run our code. We see instead of getting 200, which is what we expected, we get 110. What happens if we run it again? No, oh, now we get 109. Run it again. 109. 110. Well, this is interesting. The behavior is not what we expected at all. And then from run to run, it's actually changing. Why is this happening? Well. And I go ahead and download this code and run it yourself too. It's kind of fun. Um, even though this instruction here, this thread.count equals thread.count plus one, to us that looks like there's no way that couldn't happen. Why could that not happen? Um, the problem is, is we're looking at a higher level language and when you start breaking down the code into the assembly or into the, the Java um, virtual machine, instructions. This is going to get broken into lots and lots of instructions actually. It doesn't, it's quite a lot when, it, when you actually look at it um, at kind of at the assembly level. And so what happens is the thread gets interrupted. Um, it will execute maybe part of the statement and then the next thread comes in because um, of scheduling, of waiting, whatever, in the JVM, and the value that got updated here gets overwritten by the other thread when the other thread assigns the value to it. And so this is why multi-threading programming can be so um, challenging and tedious and hard to debug. Um, you have to be very careful dealing with the parts that are concurrent. So these would be considered concurrent sections and we should actually be using synchronization methods um, to fix this and make sure that this sort of behavior doesn't happen. And now those synchronization methods are a great topic but something um, that we will you'll be looking at further in your programming career. So I hope this was a good introduction to multi-threading and uh, enjoy the code.